Th thanks so much, Corey. Um, and thanks to everyone for, for coming out. Um, it's great to be in this room again. The last time I was in this auditorium was in June. I was a fan of the Cody Monologues play, and they had their grand finale here. Um, and so I w enjoyed being part, uh, you know, getting to witness that. Afterwards, you know, you have to go to the bathroom. And I was standing at the urinal, and two guys standing at the urinals next to me. One of them was like, boy, that Caroline Lockhart was quite a character, wasn't she? And then, yeah, did you read the book about her? And I'm like, oh my god, that's, that's my book being talked about at a urinal. This is, so, so this is the, the site of one of my greatest professional uh, memories here. Um, um, but today I want to talk about public lands. And I like to roam around, so if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to try turning on this mic and walking around. That's fine. Great. Um, so many of us know public lands. Uh, we're surrounded by them. We recreate on them all the time. But just to sort of set the stage, here's a map of public lands across the United States, obviously far more important in the West. Uh, you have the bright green national parks lighter green national forests, uh, yellow BLM lands covering a lot of western Wyoming. Um, I'm not crazy about this map because it does show Indian reservations in red as public lands. They're actually tribal lands, not public lands. Uh, but just sort of a general sense of uh, um, the, the scope of public lands, the types of public lands. We have wonderful scenic mountains and rivers, we have deserts and prairies, we have national seashores, right, are a form of public lands, uh, national battlefields commemorating our history um, on the landscape, wildlife refuges uh, helping us to uh, uh, help other creatures. Public lands are often used for grazing, uh, sometimes for hunting, uh, winter sports as well. And so there's this huge diversity of human activities that take place on a variety of public lands. Um, and it felt like over the last five to eight years, there has been something of a, a, a sort of an opportunity to reconsider our public lands vision. Uh, this is a photo of Donald Trump at the signing ceremony for the act that he took in rescinding the, uh, most of the Bears Ears National Park dedication. As you may recall, President Obama had set aside a large park, national park in Utah, Bears Ears, uh, or maybe a national monument. Um, yeah, excuse me, national monument. Um, and Trump drastically reduced the size of that. And I, I felt like what he was doing was saying, are we sure that our vision of public lands is the one that has been working for the last 100 years or so, is really what we want? And it was an interesting moment for me because I was like, I really like public lands, but where did they come from? If I like them so much, why can't I articulate more effectively the origin story of those public lands. And so that's what got me thinking about this topic. If we like public lands, we should know where they come from. If we are concerned with the current public lands uh, platform, if we want to rescind it, we should also know where they come from. And so just to review, we're talking about national parks, national forests, BLM lands, there's many types of agencies that, uh, that manage public lands. And of course, public lands also include state lands, local lands, uh, you know, things like libraries and, and city parks are also public lands in that sense. And it's really unusual, and especially historically unusual, that these lands are collectively, permanently owned in commons by the American people. There hadn't really been such a tradition. I mean, if you think back, 
Yeah, there's been lots of royal lands in Britain that were owned by the king or queen, um, and likewise in many other uh, countries around the globe, there, are, there have been people who were in control of the government who were also in control of a lot of land. But the American public lands tradition was one that said, yeah, we're gonna have it be controlled democratically by the people. And it has been so successful over the last 100 years that in the discussions um, around Bears Ears and other public lands uh, debates of the last, uh, of, of the late 2010s, um, that a lot of fans of public land started referring to it as a birthright. These are lands that we have inherited from the people who came before us, and what are we going to do to make sure they will still exist for our children and grandchildren in, in largely the same shape they are now? But again, that had me pondering where they had come from. And it turns out there's, before we had the phrase public lands, there, it, it's sort of difficult. It's sort of troubling to think about that story because after all, all the lands in North America were once the province of uh, indigenous people and lands have been taken from those tribes, sometimes by treaty, sometimes by purchase, sometimes by uh, more violent, perhaps even theft. Um, and so public lands are sort of a, a vivid reminder of that. It's sort of an original sin, right, of American history. It, it's not just public lands that were taken from the tribes, it's, it's all lands, it's my house, it's your houses, it's this building here. Um, and yet we have built so much culture on the private lands that the public lands still being quote unquote unoccupied seem like a, a, a more vivid example of what used to be and is it fair that it's uh, changed in this way. Um, but for many years, for most of the 1800s, when the federal government owned land, it was simply land that had not yet been homesteaded. That early America was so invested in the idea of private land, of course all land would be privately owned, that the, uh, they didn't use the phrase, but the public lands were simply lands that were waiting to be homesteaded. And so the shift that I'm gonna look at in a minute here w was really remarkable from, okay, yeah, this isn't just land that's waiting for its new purpose as a homestead. Um, one of the phrases that was used a lot in the 1800s that again is a little bit uncomfortable is, is this unoccupied, idea of unoccupied lands. Again, obviously they had been occupied for many, many generations by indigenous people, just maybe not the same way that white people occupied them. But that word unoccupied actually appeared even in a, uh, a series of, of treaties in 1868 with uh, with the Crow tribe, also with the Shoshones and the Bannocks, that they would retain the right to hunt on unoccupied land. In other words, they couldn't hunt on private lands, they couldn't hunt in your backyard, but the unoccupied lands, um, they would not be, uh, you know, they would be free to hunt and, and regulate uh, that their own way. Um, and that is still at issue, that this idea of hunting unoccupied lands. Uh, this picture is of some Crow tribal members at the Supreme Court in 2019 with the Herrera decision. Some of you may be familiar uh, with the Crow hunter who was caught uh, poaching in the Bighorn National Forest um, and claimed that he had the right from this 1868 treaty to do so. And it was a twisting, torturous case. At one point, the state of Wyoming was arguing that the Bighorn National Forest was not unoccupied because it had been dedicated to a purpose as a national forest. Um, and so quite a shift from 1868 when we did believe that those lands were unoccupied. <laughs> 
So before we had an idea of public lands, we had a lot of conflicting and troubling um, ways of thinking about those lands. But what I'd like to do uh, for, for the majority of, uh, of our next few minutes here is to talk about, to, to sort of celebrate how this idea of public lands has really, uh, has really benefited so many Americans. Um, and I want to do it by talking about stories. You know, every time we love a software company, it turns out that the guy started it in his garage, right? There's never been a software company that was started by a multi guy who was a multimillionaire already and had a big office park. It was always a garage. Um, and so origin stories are incredibly important. And one agency that's been really good at telling an origin story is the National Park Service. And so this is a picture of the uh, confluence of the Madison, uh, uh, excuse me, the Gibbon and the Firehole becoming the Madison River in Yellowstone. I'm sure most of you people have been here. This is a 1950s reenactment of the moment in 1870 when uh, members of an expedition, having just been among the first white people to see these wonders, debated what should be done with them. Um, and a man named Cornelius Hedges said, rather than trying to uh, homestead these lands, privatize them, try and make money by developing private tourist att attractions, maybe they should be held jointly by the nation for the benefit of all. Um, and so this is the origin of the national park idea, America's best idea in the words of, of Wallace Stegner, um, and has led to this wonderful legacy of, of parks we have around the country. Um, historians are a little bit iffy about that. How exactly did that conversation play out? The idea had been around before Hedges mentioned it, but the Park Service continued to tell this story as often as they could. Um, to help the public get familiar with the idea, with the story of public lands. Um, so the uh, top picture here is of the 50th anniversary of Yellowstone, 1922, and we have Horace Albright, the superintendent of the park, uh, standing next to Charles Cook, an early explorer. Um, he had actually been through Yellowstone in uh, 1869 and was still alive and living in White Sulphur Springs and they brought him down and uh, and had him uh, tell his stories and treated him like the hero that he was um, and standing next to them is a woman I believe that's Ann Albright uh, of the National Press Association or some sort of uh, journalist publicist they would invited a bunch of journalists to come out on a junket to Yellowstone in midsummer and enjoy the wonder of public lands and they put up this sign at the junction of these rivers to commemorate the moment when we first had national parks. Um, the lower picture is uh, three dignitaries in front of uh, the museum. If you've been there to the uh, Madison Confluence, you've seen a cute little museum there, a nice little log building overlooking um, the, uh, uh, the, the river and meadows that was built as a museum to celebrate this moment of setting aside of national parks. Um, and so the, the little guy on the left is Herman Carey Bumpus. I just love saying that name, Herman Carey Bumpus, uh, who was in charge of interpretation for the parks. Um, the middle guy is Kenneth Chorley of the Rockefeller Foundation who was funding some of that. Um, and the guy on the right, his name is escaping me just now, but he was uh, the architect who came up with the cool design for those museums. So through all of their events, through all of their places such as this museum, the Park Service was really good at telling its origin story and thus telling the origin story of public lands, or at least one form of public lands, because as we saw in that map at the beginning, there are lots of types of public lands. For example, there are also national forests. 
Some of you may have read Timothy Egan's book, The Big Burn, which gives a delightful origin story for the Forest Service coming into its own during the huge fires in uh, northern Idaho and northwest Montana in, in 1910, finding its purpose in the heroic activities of some of the firefighters out there um, and of the idea of saving the forests for a sustainable timber harvest long into the future. Um, but does anyone know where the first national forest was? Right here, yeah, yeah. It's, I ask this question elsewhere and people are totally baffled. <laughs> Even in, in, in Red Lodge, I'll confess, uh, I live in Red Lodge and I didn't know that the Shoshone, that what is now the Shoshone National Forest was the first in the nation. It was called the Yellowstone Park Timberland Reserve, set aside in 1891 by President Harrison. Um, and so, you know, 1891 to 1910, the forests had been around for a while, but just hadn't been good at telling their origin story um, as far as being a form of public lands, um, perhaps on the same level as the Park Service. And so as I dug into this, I also discovered there was another moment in history that might serve as an origin story for public lands in general. And it happened here at Lake McDonald in Glacier National Park in 1896. So at that point, Lake McDonald, along with a lot of other um, lands in the West, was simply public domain. It was this land that has not yet been homesteaded, land that's sort of unoccupied. Um, it, it had a, a fuzzy classification. Benjamin Harrison had started setting aside forest reserves in 1891, but it appears that when Congress passed the law that allowed him to do that, they didn't really know what they were doing. Um, Congress, believe it or not, was really dysfunctional at that time, and they couldn't they weren't really sure that these forest reserves were a good idea, and so they passed all sorts of contradictory legislation. They did not give any budget for managing these forest reserves. They did not give any sort of charter for goals for what these forest reserves should become. Um, and so the people in the Interior Department who were charged with managing them finally just sort of threw up their hands and said, if Congress isn't going to tell us what the purpose of these things are, we're just going to declare them off limits. And so they put up hundreds of signs at the entrance to public lands saying no trespassing. These lands belong to the federal government and so you can't go onto them. It's just so totally foreign to the way we experience public lands today. And that may have been sort of a prod to Congress, hey, please do something, because after all, they had no budget for enforcing that law, that no trespassing law, so you probably could trespass anyways. Um, but it was clearly a, a huge crisis moment for the nation. And the uh, president at this point, it was. Uh, Grover Cleveland was, w w was faced with this insoluble problem that Congress just refused, or Congress actually just didn't know. How can, how can we, wh what should we do? What should these lands be? And so, you know, Harrison, or, or excuse me, uh, Cleveland did what, what politicians always do. He appointed a blue ribbon commission. Uh, he called it the National Forest Commission, um, and he appointed a bunch of uh, notable scientists. Um, one of the most interesting from our perspective in this area was a man named Arnold Haig who had been a geologist in Yellowstone for uh, a couple of decades. Um, but uh, yeah, he just sort of said, okay, National Forest Commission, tour around the West and tell us what to do. At this point, I want to introduce some characters, make this story a little lively. 
This is John Muir standing with President Teddy Roosevelt in Yosemite. John Muir um, was a guest on that National Forest Commission. Um, Muir was famous for exploring, especially exploring the Sierra. This is a picture of him. Um, a guy ran into him, I don't know, 10 or 20 miles from the trailhead. He had no food. He had no tent or backpack. He'd been out for days. He couldn't really remember how many. And he was perfectly happy. He was just, yeah, sure, I'm going to travel around for a while longer. Um, John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, the nation's first grassroots environmental organization. Uh, its, pr its first president, he was sort of a figurehead, but had that job for oh, over 20 years. Um, one of the big things that the Sierra Club did in that era was to take people on summer expeditions up in the Sierra. And so this is Muir here pointing out something um, uh, alongside the trail and all the Sierra Club members watching him uh, because he was so fun to listen to. He had this Scottish brogue and, uh, and, and just knew so much and told such great stories about being out in nature. Some of those stories he collected in books. Uh, this is one of his more famous ones, Our National Parks. All of his books have been in print ever since the 1890s when they first came out, never going out of print. Uh, John Muir, also the only person to have a national park or monument named after him while he was still alive. Uh, this is Muir Woods, north of San Francisco. Uh, a man who wanted to save these incredible redwood trees donated this parcel to the federal government to be used as a park or monument. His only stipulation was that it should be named after John Muir. He had never met Muir, he had just been inspired by his books. So Muir really have, had a big uh, force in his lifetime. Um, and Muir was perhaps his best claim was as a philosopher. And we, how do you know that someone is a philosopher? The answer is that we have lots of memes of their quotes. Uh, so uh, these are memes that I just found on the internet. How glorious a greeting the sun gives to the mountains. Muir would always have these sayings that would help inspire people to have a better relationship to nature. The clearest way to the universe is through a forest wilderness. I'd rather be in the mountains thinking of God than in a church thinking about the mountains. That one registers with a lot of people these days. In every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. So nature, such a force. You think about the, eight, the eight, late 1800s and all the industrialization and people moving to the cities and Muir reminding them of how wonderful nature can be. So of all the paths you take in life, make sure a few of them are dirt. In God's wildness lies the hope of the world. The mountains are calling, and I must go. Uh, there's a much more complex context to that particular quote, but that's one that certainly here in the mountains we, uh, we see a lot. So in summary, John Muir, advocate for Yosemite, co-founder of the Sierra Club, author, scientist. I always overlook this part. He, he was the first one to look at Yosemite and say, this must have been formed by glaciers. Everyone else previously had thought maybe it was earthquakes or maybe it was just sort of created that way. And he said, no, look at the way the glaciers must have pushed it out. Um, got into big fights with the scientists of the day. And um, today, basically, it's, it's his view. Um, and, and, a, and a wanderer, just a delightful sort of outdoor adventurer. Um, but I came to see that his, his biggest sort of quest in life was as an evangelist. Now, his father was one of those fire and brimstone evangelists, or you are going to hell. Um, but John Muir was more like, you know, hey, he saw God in nature. He, he felt this deep spiritual, maybe religious experience when he was in nature. He wanted other people to have that experience, too. And so he would talk about, you need to have this experience. But he also realized that you really need to preserve nature in order to have these experiences. Let me shift now to Gifford Pinchot, also on that National Forest Commission. Sometimes 
seen as the enemy of John Muir. Pinchot, best known as the founder of the US Forest Service. I was talking about how the forest reserves were created in 1891. In 1905, President Roosevelt reorganized that, uh, that agency and transferred it from Department of Interior, which had some corruption problems, to Department of Agriculture. Um, and Pinchot led that whole effort, just an organizational uh, genius at managing those people, inspiring them to work for him. Um, he was also Roosevelt's advisor on all sorts of issues, mostly natural resource issues. Um, but that is probably Roosevelt's biggest legacy is, is natural resource issues. Uh, Pinchot is sometimes called America's first forester. Um, more accurately, he's the first university trained American born professional forester. Uh, but nevertheless, a, a strong advocate for the discipline or, or even science of, of forestry. Um, he wrote a few books, they're not as good as Muir's. Um, and he was a politician. He, uh, he served two basically successful terms as the governor of Pennsylvania after he left the Forest Service. Um, but Pinchot, his big thing was that he was a statesman. He was born with a fair bit of money and rather than trying to make more money, he said, well, I'd like to help people. I'd like to help my nation. I'd like to do something for the good of everyone. And so he constantly talked about the Forest Service serving the greatest good for the greatest number of people in the long run, um, which was a well-known utilitarian uh, uh, precept at that time, uh, John Stuart Mill. Um, Pinchot claimed to have added in the long run, although when you start thinking about it, it's still a little bit vague. Who decides what the greatest good is and who counts and what counts as long run. But it was nevertheless such a refreshing uh, change from the common view at that time that, yeah, we need to do everything right now for our immediate benefit. And he's saying, hey, maybe we need to start looking towards the future and planning more successfully for the future. Maybe we need to use our natural resources for everyone. If these, especially given that we have public lands, they should be managed for all, not simply for the wealthy, not simply for the politically connected. We need to conserve these resources. We need to conserve the forests, the trees. Forestry is all about having, not cutting down all the trees today so we can have some to cut down tomorrow or, or next year or next decade. Um, but likewise, water, uh, uh, grasses, uh, you know, any, anything a lot of the stuff that we think of now as sustainability is really Pinchot's conservation. He didn't exactly invent it, but he certainly popularized it and embodied it and successfully managed it in his era. And so these end up being sort of rival environmental philosophies. You have Muir and preservation and Pinchot and conservation. And so preservation has come to be the national parks, which are, you know, we're going to keep them so that your grandchildren can have the same experience in Yellowstone that you did with your grandparents. That means that we're very reluctant to touch anything. You know, there's no logging in a national park, no hunting in Yellowstone, et cetera. It's almost an idea that nature is good and people are bad. Every time we go in and try and manage or manipulate something, we end up messing it up. Whereas conservation employed on the national forests involves, you know, notions of uh, sustainable yield. And so that whole sustainability angle, keeping things for tomorrow so that we can have a constant stream of resources. Because after all, people are part of nature. We are using natural resources as we live and we can't simply preserve everything. We need to interact with nature successfully. Um, they're both great ideas. There, there, there does feel to be some conflict between them. What do you do on any individual piece of land? And so over the last um, well, 100 years, Pinchot and Muir have come to be seen as enemies. 
And what I realized is that they're not enemies, they're rivals. Um, and I had this realization because I grew up in Massachusetts in the 70s and 80s with uh, Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics. Um, and I hated Magic Johnson from the Lakers, right? Because the Lakers were beating the Celtics in the, in the championship games when the Celtics weren't beating the Lakers. Um, but that's not to say that Magic Johnson was evil. I knew he was a great basketball player. And in fact, the rivalry between Bird and Magic got the NBA to new heights of popularity in that era. So even people who have differing talents, you know, Magic was sort of the fast-breaking point guard and Bird was the outside shooting rebounder. Uh, different philosophies about basketball, the Lakers and the Celtics played very different styles, but they can unite in a common purpose um, of promoting the sport of basketball. And so likewise, Muir and Pinchot, with their differing philosophies, differing talents, differing views of how to think about nature, maybe they could unite to promote a common cause, such as lands that are publicly owned. So Muir, the Californian, I guess, has to play for the Lakers, and, uh, the, uh, and Pinchot can play for the Celtics. Um, if you stare too long at this, you realize that we have some body color issues, that it turns out that people 100 years ago maybe weren't as racially diverse as we might like, but that's probably a story for a different presentation. Um, so what I found as I dug into the lives of Muir and Pinchot and thought about this question of public lands was that public lands really were the result of the combination of preservation and conservation, the Park Service and the Forest Service being successful philosophies for managing public lands. Muir was sort of a prophet. Pinchot was sort of a statesman. It took both types of talents to give us the legacy of public lands we have today. And that legacy is really unique because it's democracy and nature. We often think of our public lands as nature's lands, as belonging to nature and the animals and whatnot. But really what I came to see as I researched this book was that um, they're democracy's lands. Right? The amazing thing about the forests or, or the BLM or the Park Service, we all have them uh, so wonderfully here uh, in, in Cody and the, and the surrounding area. The wonderful thing is that they are decided by us, along with several hundred million other Americans. Um, if we decide to change our priorities for what we want for parks or forests or other forms of BLM or other forms of land, such as the BLM, um, we will make that happen, and that's a really a remarkable um, feature of our democracy. Um, and so the 1896 National Forest Commission, Pinchot and Muir were camped together at Lake McDonald. Um, Pinchot took Muir fishing. Muir was not a fisherman. He was, he, he, he was not a hunter. He was... He, he seemed to, he hardly ate anything in the woods. He would go on these long trips and he would just bring a hunk of cheese and maybe a few slices of bread. Um, he, he loved creatures so much that he hated the notion of, of killing them. And yet, he was willing to go fishing with Gifford Pinchot, marvelous fisherman trained on the, on the small creeks of uh, uh, northeast Pennsylvania. Um, and they shared time together uh, at the Grand Canyon. They, they snuck off from all the distinguished scientists and made a campfire overlooking the rim of the canyon and Muir told stories until early in the morning. Um, and so that National Forest Commission turned out to be a great bonding of these ideas that I have summarized here. Uh, it took a while, they made some mistakes in the implementation uh, of, their, uh, of, of their ideal but 
by 1898 or so, thanks in part to the writings of John Muir as well as the organization of Gifford Pinchot, this idea of public lands as a sort of a superset of national parks and what were then called forest reserves. That idea of public lands had really lodged firmly in the American mind and was able to grow through the next decade with, with Teddy Roosevelt and then through the subsequent decades with all sorts of leaders um, in, a, in a variety of, of fields, both politicians and scientists and, and whatnot. Um, public lands was able to grow then. So that the origin of public lands turns out to be actually really interesting and, and sort of inspiring in terms of the way that our American culture and our American political system has aligned with nature, not always totally successfully, not always as quickly or wholeheartedly as we might want, um, but still with a remarkable advance in the origins of public lands. So that concludes the material that I had prepared for our presentation today, but I believe we have time for questions, and I think Corey will distribute these microphones if you have questions, and I will transfer to this one. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, I will run around to any audience members that have a, um, have a question so that our online audience can hear the mic as well. So raise a hand and I'll come around. Uh, right. We got someone starting us off. Our online audience won't hear you though. And then could you just repeat that for folks online? Sure, right. So the question is about Muir's role in preservation in California uh, with some of the parks there even before 1872. So it's a little bit hard for those of us in greater Yellowstone to accept. We like to think that Yellowstone was the first national park. Yosemite was actually set aside previously. Uh, and it's sort of a funny story, right? It was 1861, I believe. Uh, early 1860s, when white people came across this incredibly gorgeous valley, Yosemite, uh, in California, and they said, wow, this, this is special. This can't be just one of our vaguely sort of not yet homesteaded, unoccupied lands. This needs to be something. Um, and because American culture at that time was very states' rights oriented, Clearly, the thing to do was to hand it over to the state of California as a park. And so the legislation sailed through Congress that this will be um, a park, a state park. And so nine years later, when they encountered the same sort of situation uh, in Yellowstone, hey, yeah, this is special. It, it's, it's a lot like Yosemite. It needs to be set aside. We'll just give it to the state of uh-oh, Wyoming is still a territory. The, it, Wyoming isn't set up to, to receive this. We'll have to hold it at the federal level. And so, you know, again, as, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of Yellowstone, as, as I'm sure you all are too. As much as we would love for Yellowstone to be the original national park, the idea sort of started in Yosemite and it came about here almost by accident. And it was the same sort of deal as the forest reserves, that the Congress said, sure, we'll sign the legislation, but we won't give any priorities, we won't give any budget, so that the first superintendents of Yellowstone worked for free. Uh, they did not have the authority to evict uh, or arrest poachers. Uh, they didn't have the authority to, to do anything, really. They were just trying to figure things out, and it took a few years for that authority and that budget to grow to where Yellowstone was really successful. And so then in California, Yosemite was a state park for, gosh, 40 years, I think, and increasingly poorly managed by sometimes corrupt state authorities. 
and Muir, who had lived in the valley for a couple of years, who had gotten frustrated with overgrazing, especially by sheep, whom he called hooved locusts, um, kept lobbying the state and lobbying the state and not really getting anywhere, and finally started aligning with, uh, with some of his editors, actually, his magazine editors, who had better national connections, and started bringing in national pressure to both, uh, to both reform that state park, and then they built sort of a national park. It originally it was a donut around the valley was the national park, and then finally got the state park incorporated into the national park um, uh, because the state wasn't managing it effectively. So I, I hope that's the story you were looking for. If not, you, have, you can tell a different one. Um, presumably, you're aware of the uh, book on myth and history in the creation of Yellowstone, and so presumably they are no longer touting that pretty debunked um, creation story. Correct. Yeah. The uh, you know I, I I showed the picture of the museum um, at Madison Junction, and that building is sort of underutilized now because it had been built to tell this story, and now the Park Service um, is not actively telling this story anymore because, uh, you know, it, as the Park Service has increasingly embraced science over the last 50 years, facts are really important. And so historians said, yeah, facts are really important. We can't just be talking about myths in the creation of Yellowstone. So Yellowstone tells that, tells its origin story less and less and less forcefully than it used to. I do think there are some elements of fact in that story. Cornelius Hedges probably said something to the effect of, yeah, this should be public, um, but because we don't really know, they aren't, uh, aren't as vigorous in telling that story anymore. It's sort of funny, though, it, the story ended up seeping into the culture so much in our consciousness that a lot of us learn it that way in school anyways. Our online audience can't hear you, Buzz. You got to think of that. Um, I don't care about online. They're not here. <laughs> I, I was just wondering ooh, more about the, the process of the presidential commission. I mean, did it last for years or did it last for months? Or, And then did Congress say what good ideas you recommended and we adopt them? So the National Forest Commission, um, it was actually under the auspices of the National Science Foundation um, because that was sort of going to be a, a, a nonpartisan view of, of the science of what to do here. And they really, in their first months, they bungled the assignment. They had toured around the West and they had seen all these rich forests and they had debated how to manage them. And so they realized that they needed to do two things. One would be to declare these management principles and the other would be to sort of declare which lands they should uh, work on. And they did it backwards. Uh, on, uh, on Washington's birthday, 1897, they announced a whole new slew of protected forest reserves. But because they hadn't announced their management policies yet, people were afraid that all these new lands would be uh, subject to this no trespassing policy. And so there was this huge uproar um, and Congress was passing, was, I believe they even passed a law that would rescind all of the forest reserves, all of the good work that had been done for six years previously. And it came to, um, uh, to Cleveland on his last day in office. The, the new president is ready, is coming to, to start the parade for inauguration day and Cleveland's got this one law that was passed just, uh, just last night, and, and it's got, you know, I mean, back before computers, it's got little, not even sticky notes, it's just got sort of sheets of paper stuck in there, and he goes, I don't understand this, and he throws it on the ground. It's this huge dramatic event that I'd never heard of before. Um, and so, I mean, that sort of almost exacerbated the crisis and, and raised public awareness, and that's when Muir started writing articles to really convince people of the power of public lands. And so Muir was terrified that uh, you know, the, the next session of Congress, they would again pass a law to eliminate all the public lands. 
but in fact, I, I believe largely to his articles and her, his persuasive powers. Um, you know, somebody attempted to pass such a law in the next Congress, but it received no support whatsoever because, you know, uh, I, I think as often happens today, it was really Congress ends up doing the will of the public. It wasn't led by Congress, it was led by what the common people believed, and Muir had helped influence that, and then Congress followed suit. Uh, it's a big, complicated story. I, I, I tell most of it in Natural Rivals. I told a little bit, a bit of it. Corey mentioned that I've just started this Substack newsletter called Natural Stories, and that happens to be this week's um, uh, feature in that newsletter. So I've got cards in the back Please grab one. Uh, you can subscribe to National Stories for free. The boundary of the Yellowstone Park Timber Reserve used to come right down here by our mountains outside of town, if I'm right. So it's interesting that the first national park and the first national forest overlapped each other at one time. What compromise was raised to make where the park boundary would be and where the national forest boundary would be? Um, you guys living here may know this history better than I do living in Red Lodge, but let me try to uh, summarize what I understand. When the park was established, they sort of picked boundaries almost at random. Well, let's go 20 miles east of here and 20 miles south of there. And so those are the lines. And back then, Yellowstone was a simple square. Um, and Arnold Haig, I mentioned the geologist, he was the one who really saw the potential in the law in 1891 that would allow the president to set aside forest reserves. And he said, I've been fighting for years to expand the boundaries of Yellowstone. Here's a way to effectively do that, and we don't have to get Congress involved. This is great. Um, and so he drew those boundaries of the original forest reserve. Um, Eventually, that forest reserve became a uh, national forest, and it has had several different names and several different boundary changes and a few land exchanges with the park. Um, but yeah, it was first the, the randomness of the park boundaries, and then Haig. Uh, again, nobody knew much about those lands, so he's drawing a straight line through what he, not through, but around what he hoped would be valuable habitat. Wait for Gordy in the mic again. I recently heard the BLM referred to as the Bureau of Livestock and Mining. <laughs> um, and recently we've also had a little controversy over uh, adding uh, a conservation in there along with to our public lands. Our public, I'm talking about rangelands and maybe the Great Basin lands that were taken over by LDS years before we really managed this landscape. We have, we have really beautiful Yellowstone and, and, and the parks, but w today we have needs that we didn't see back then. It would have been nice if we had a Buffalo National Park in Montana. That would be a, a fun thing to and, and it's something we should do. Uh, we, we are not, uh, I mean, these are pretty lands, but our rangelands are pretty too. You, well done, you brought up so many great points. Um, and you know, let me expand on a couple of them. Um, you may have heard of the American Prairie Reserve in Montana which is working to preserve some of these beautiful buffalo rangelands as a private organization. And so this is sort of the alternative model to the public lands model. Maybe we can accomplish these same wildlife goals under private ownership with donations, with uh, you know, just a, a, a few key uh, purchases of, of key habitats. Um, Personally, I'm a little bit skeptical that it'll, that it'll work, but I'm certainly glad they're trying because there's no inherent reason that the public lands model has to be the only one. Um, so in effect, we do have a Buffalo National Park, except it's a private park. 
Uh, you can go visit. I have not yet gone to see it, but some of my friends have described it as a, as a magical experience. And yet, the value of the public lands model is that the purposes of the public lands can change as public interest changes. And so 50 years ago, when everyone was really interested in mining and logging and extractive resource use, then you had an, uh, multiple agencies, BLM and Forest Service, focused on those priorities. As the public has wanted more conservation, then conservation can be included in the goals of those agencies. Um, whereas, you know, how would that work under a private land model? We just have to hope that whoever is in charge of the American Prairie Reserve always has the same values as the public at large. Um, and so it's the strength of democracy. It's also the curse of democracy because it never seems to work as fast as we want and we have to argue with people and we go to boring public meetings and it's all very stressful and miserable. Um, but it is sort of magical too. Uh, John, would you speak to the, uh, the really great and continuing impact of the 1906 Antiquities Act on how it uh, allowed changes and uh, substantial changes in the existing public lands? So yeah, the, the Antiquities Act in 1906 was what allowed presidents to set aside national monuments. I, I had always, I, I hadn't really grasped before I got into this project, what's the difference between national monument and national park? And basically the difference is that the national park is created by Congress and national monument is created unilaterally by the executive branch. Um, and so, the original Antiquities Act called for these lands to be set aside to preserve what they called antiquities then, um, uh, such as Mesa Verde, um, really cool old archeological sites. And so a lot of the debate has been, well, what counts as an antiquity? And the tribes in Utah made a really interesting argument that the entire landscape counted as an antiquity because it represented their, uh, their predecessor's lifestyle in that, in that landscape. That was a controversial argument and you know, I, I think the opponents of Bears Ears did have some interesting points about are we really stretching the 1906 Antiquities Act beyond where it can go. And yet, you know, big surprise, Congress is really dysfunctional. Um, and so it has been really hard to create new national parks. And when, uh, when scientists and park managers are calling for greater preservation, uh, sometimes the executive branch needs to act unilaterally as it did in 1897 um, to set aside lands uh, as national monuments. A lot, th this has happened so frequently in the history of national parks. People are not sure it's a good idea Congress isn't willing to commit. President set aside the Grand Canyon National Monument. Later, oh yeah, yeah, that's a great national park. And so it's easy to, for that to become a national park. Uh, same thing in the Tetons, right? Um, and so there is some historical precedent for Bears Ears and other places that Obama or, or now, and now Biden have set aside as national monuments maybe they will evolve to be non-controversial national parks, or maybe we will decide that that was too much of uh, a stretch of the interpretation of the Antiquities Act. I don't wanna be up here preaching my particular views. I think there can be multiple uh, potential outcomes. We'll have time for one or two more questions, and then John has a, uh, a special treat for us too. I wanna to give him a chance and some time for that. Um, as a follow-on to that, and a lot of people don't realize this, Wyoming is the only state the Antiquities Act doesn't apply to. Mm -hmm. Due to the compromise in 1950 to make Grand Teton a national park, and that greatly changes the dynamic of uh, public lands in Wyoming. Thanks for bringing that up. I had not known that. <laughs> 
Yeah, but no additional ones can be created. And that's post-1950. So, so his, his point was that uh, we have some national monuments in Wyoming that were created 100 years ago. But with the 1950 law that created Grand Teton, um, that there was a compromise that said no future national monuments could be created under the Antiquities Act in Wyoming. Um, and, and this gentleman is saying Fossil Butte was created in the 60s and so must have been different. And I don't, I'm sad to say I, I, I can't illuminate this. I don't know anything about this. So we'll, we'll leave it for debate or, or maybe you have an answer. Yeah. So, uh, one final question. Yeah. Notes. Great. Yes, I yes I do. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I I will say that it is in the canyon country in Utah, and it is uh, it is not a national park. So. So I'm sure there are a, a few more questions for John. John has been generous enough to hang around for a little while after. Um, John is going to be back uh, by the table here. Um, he has, uh, did, would you like to say a few of the things? He has brought an assortment of the books he's authored, um, but rather than steal all of John's thunder there. It, it, it's been a delight to chat with you. The, the questions have been marvelous. Uh, very knowledgeable audience. Thank you for sharing uh, your time with me. I'm happy to continue these conversations. And if you would like to, uh, to purchase a book, uh, we have them for sale. Or uh, again, if you would like to uh, subscribe to Natural Stories, I've got some cards up there and you can take it home and, uh, um, and follow up that way. So, uh, so thanks again. Thank you. And join us all in December, December 7th, for our final lunchtime expedition presentation with Mr. Eric Atkinson of Northwest.